Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fun show for you this evening. John Monette is here, and uh, it's just going to be a, a great, great night of talking about the uh, experience that he has had in making the company of Sonics Aircraft, uh, uh, Sonics Aircraft, come into life. Just uh, so, so excited about that. Before we get started, as always, a few notes. The first thing I would like to announce is this is our 75th show. That is so amazing. Um, going back to the very beginning, we started Social Flight Live to support you and everyone in general aviation. We started at the beginning of the pandemic, and the idea at that time was to bring to you um, all of the uh, inspiring people from general aviation and just have an evening of chatting and learning about their background and having all of us have an opportunity just to, to, to experience this wealth of knowledge and these wonderful stories from inspirational people in general aviation during a time of great challenge for everyone out there. And I'm thrilled that this has been something that has really uh, continued and taken off and that we continue to receive wonderful stories from all of you about how having this opportunity has helped uh, support you and support general aviation during this time. And I would like to make an offer to everyone, um, send in your stories of your flying and your, your time uh, during the uh, pandemic and during this time of what you've been able to do to support general aviation and uh, how things like what we're doing tonight have helped support things during this time. And uh, in that, we're going to choose one. We're going to give away a custom pair of Flying Eyes eyewear. So take a look for that. In addition to that, we are still through socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. Uh, we are in the midst of giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. So be sure to get on that. You do that by getting the Social Flight mobile app and just going out there and flying. It's part of our Fly to Win Challenge. All you need to do is have that app, go fly, check in at your local airport or anywhere that you're flying, and you are automatically entered to win in that contest. So, so, so much fun. We just wanna do everything we can for you. And another quick reminder, we will be off for the next two weeks. We're at NBAA and doing some other flying adventures. And so we will be back on two weeks from tonight on October 26th with Brent Mall of Mall Aircraft. So with that, I would like to introduce John Monette, founder of Sonics Aircraft. On February 28th, 1998, John lifted off from Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh, Wisconsin in a completely new aircraft, the Sonics SX-1. This marked the beginning of that story for thousands of Sonex builders and pilots worldwide. John is a multi-thousand hour private pilot with both glider and float plane ratings and an AMP mechanic. His designs include the, um, the Sonari, um, uh, the, sorry, the Sonari Sport Aircraft Series. I was connect, uh, corrected on this earlier because I've been saying it wrong now for pro uh, about as long as he's probably been making aircraft the Monari sail, uh, sailplane, the Monari motor glider, the Monex racer, uh, along with numerous other home-built aircraft. John was inducted into EAA's Home Builder Hall of Fame in 2001, and his designs are on display at the Udbar Hazy National Air and Space Museum, and of course, at his home airport, the EAA Air Venture Museum. And so uh, with that, I would like to please welcome to the show, John Monet. How are you doing, John? This is great, Jeff. Thank you, and I'm um, happy to be here. And apologies again, because for years I have been mispronouncing the name of your aircraft and probably your company. You, we could probably fill a stadium with the number of people that have mispronounced that. <laughs> and if I had a nickel, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at the beginning, because someone with your storied past and accomplishments, I want to get to all the aircraft, but I want to start with how you got started. What's your, what's your background? What brought you into aviation to get started? My sister. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, uh, she had a boyfriend building little model airplanes. You know, this is back in the 50s. And, uh, uh, you know, they were kind of stick together pine airplanes and the uh, little Bonanza model. And 
and I, I stuck it together and of course she pointed out that the leading edges were blunt and square and uh, you know uh, so I got admonished for that and, and uh, you know went on to uh, build a lot more models uh, and uh, eventually get into radio control models uh, back in the late 50s and uh, then you know we I, I had a career uh, I was a, a high school art teacher for uh, nine years, and during that period of time, I started uh, building uh, not only radio control airplanes. Found out that you know that was that was expensive, and bought my first airplane with after I sold my radio control equipment. Yeah, that was really expensive at the time, by the way. Um, and I bought an airplane with the proceeds from the selling the model stuff. Really? And that's that got me started. So we rebuilt a couple of antiques and. Started another little home built that uh, that was a, a funny little airplane that I showed up with in Oshkosh in 1970, and then uh, we went on to the Sonarays and those things. So, and and it it got to be a point where when we introduced the Sonaray, that um, we, people asked for plans, uh, and it was built to compete with Steve Whitman, and we did a pretty good job of that. Uh, and you know, it got to a point where uh, I was not only teaching, but uh, starting a business in the basement and in, in, in my shop. Uh, and, and Betty finally said, "You know, <laughs> you're, you're killing yourself here. You know, you're working, working a full-time job and working all night on, on airplanes, and we're doing business." And she had the the twins on her back, filling out invoices and everything. So, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to build airplanes, or are we, are, we gonna, are you going to teach? And um, well, that took about that long. Uh, to make the decision that uh, <laughs> we were going to build airplanes. Wow, that and it's and so tell me about the Sonare. Like that, that I mean, that's a pretty aggressive like plane to be your your first idea for for a plane you're going to build. Well, I I did have a, a, another VW powered home built that was based on a Genie's Teeny started started, uh, you know, and it ended up uh, you know once I got it up on its tricycle gear and looked at it and said, you know, yeah, this is not exactly what I want. So I drilled the whole tail cone off and threw it away and, and uh, threw the nose gear away and made, made a standard gear airplane out of it and uh, did my first VW conversion with that. And showed up with that in 1970 at the, at the first fly-in here at, at, in Oshkosh. And then, uh, of course, Steve Whitman was, was working on his, uh, his, his V Whitman. And, and I, there's actually a, a nice article that was written about the 50 years of the Sonnery uh, in this this month's Sport Aviation, uh, which pretty much explains this, the story somewhat accurately. How, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it it just uh, started out that you know, hey, I wanted to race, and I was adventurous, and I was young, and and um, you know, we we built the airplane in nine months, and and uh, you know, I had some help. Uh, with some friends and, and people, and we got it flying uh, just a couple of weeks before the fly-in uh, at, at Oshkosh in 71. and showed up, and then, of course, people wanted, you know, plans, and then took off. I can imagine. I mean, it's a sexy-looking plane. Yeah, it was kind of funny looking in the when it first came out. We had a, we had a truck spring for, you know, it's, it's always funny because Whitman uh, was – was known for his his landing gears. Uh, uh, he he developed the spring steel gear that you see on Cessnas. He developed the tapered rod gear that you see on almost every R, a, a Vans RV out there. And um, uh, I so I I couldn't afford to build a gear like that. So I went down to a local truck spring company in Elgin and found a piece of spring steel and bent it up on a rebent it on a, on, a, on a press and made the gear out of that. And then a friend of mine contacted me, uh, uh, not, it became a friend, a guy up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, named Mike Kaur. He said, I'm, I'm building a cassette and I'm, I'm trying a new gear out. It's an aluminum gear. It's a, it looks like the steel gear, but it's aluminum gear. And, and uh, your sonnery would be perfect for that. And uh, so we got together and we became instant friends. I mean, it was just one of those deals where, you know, he was 300 miles from me and uh, we were instant friends. And uh, actually, Sonnery was the first airplane, to our knowledge, uh, yet to be challenged about that, to fly with a dural aluminum gear. 
And really? Uh, that really made it a lot sexier looking and uh, a lot of cowling work and, you know, just a jillion different propellers. Uh, so it, uh, it, uh, it, it evolved into a pretty nice little airplane. And what, what made you go? So first of all, I mean, my head's spinning with questions, of course. You, where did you get the knowledge to like to to come up with the ideas that you're coming up with the aero the the aerospace design and the structures and all the things that go with it like that you you've solved so many problems in such simple and eloquent ways where where did that come from? Well, I did know how to operate a pencil, <laughs> and um, that that that's the the best tool. Uh, yeah, I went into my engineering shop. Yeah, this is a side story. Yeah, today, like I, asked, I was talking about you know lines and curves and, and and you know doing things. I said, you know, it's like using a French curve, and uh, I get this blank stare from <laughs> all the guys. You don't freaking know what a French curve is. I said, you do know what a pencil is, right? <laughs> a ruler. <laughs> but a French curve is your next tool. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, to, 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 you know, I, I just read a lot and, and just said basic books. Uh, you know, the Sonnery is just a dirt simple airplane, really, but at its core. And um, that, was, that, was, that was it. You know, you got a weight and balance and you got a certain amount of tail area and, and uh, building the wings. And there's some features like folding wing on it that, it was that was kind of cool to work out. I'm putting a picture of the uh, again of that. What what made you go with a mid wing design too? That's that's pretty wild. Well, Steve, I mean, all the formula, you know, this formula V. This is meant to fit the formula V class racing, um, but uh, it's very similar to Formula One or the Continental racers. They're just it's a little bigger airplane, got a little more wing area, lighter wing loading, a uh, lot less power all that um, but you know originally it was designed as low wing I, you know I've always looked like the Spitfire and you know we, I had it originally sketched up as a, as a low wing airplane and uh, uh, had kind of elliptical tips on it and has an elliptical tail to, in, in homage to the Spitfire um, but when we we had F espionage I had a couple of friends up in, in Oshkosh that told us of, you know how Steve was was you know progressing on this airplane. So it was a race for us to get it, uh, the sonnery built. And uh, it, 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 I said, well, we got to make it go as fast as we can. So it became a mid-wing. And uh, it was pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, so, you know, and I managed to beat Steve Whitman once uh, in a race. And that was, that was all I needed. That's awesome. That's so, it, it's amazing. Cause this is like, you really talk about the, 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 the golden era of, Le legends of, of of the experimental aviation when you're talking about building with you and Steve and everyone going yeah. racing there. You know, it was really fun because it's just through, you know, when when uh, I had the the airplane I was talking about, the earlier airplane, uh, you know, I don't want to offend your audience, but it's the, the name of it was the Mini Mesa ship. And uh, <laughs> S-H-I-D-T, by the way, uh, with the, and uh, uh, I had it on display at, at, uh, at an air show, and, and Steve Whitman came walking by, you know, and was asking about it because he wanted to learn about VW engines, basically. And uh, so I got to know him, and uh, of course, he was instrumental in us moving up to Oshkosh in 1982. Uh, he really helped helped out a lot, and and because we were competing, but we were kind of friends, you know. And uh, I when I opened my shop there, we actually. Uh, did a lot of work for his airplane. And by talking about landing gears, his last airplane had an aluminum landing gear on it that we built. Really? Uh, that was kind of fun. And, and, and I'd just like to see his eyes today when he knows what the, sonary, uh, the Sonics uses a titanium rod gear that doesn't require any machining or anything. It just needs a couple of holes drilled in it and mounted. So that, that, uh, that, that's an even a, you know, another innovation. That I, I'm sure that he would have just uh, gone with that kick out of because on his racer he had a titanium flat spring gear uh, so the, and he was you know kind of staying on the leading edge and, and uh, <laughs> his shot his airplane the uh, big O and O is actually finished in our shop I built the cowlings and the gas tanks and the landing gear and all that stuff for it wow for the airplane you were competing against 
It went kind of, yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> but Steve was always fun because he, he would, you know, we, he'd, uh, Tony Levere would come into town and uh, I don't want to name drop, but uh, it, it was always funny. These two old goats would come into my, my, uh, and I mean goats, greater of all time, you know. Uh, and they, they, uh, they'd come into the shop and, you know, we'd, we'd, uh, We'd saw about stuff and things. So I was working on a little engine for the Monterey sailplane, and and uh, yeah, Steve would go, show Tony how that runs. That thing is awesome, dude. I was like, <laughs> then drag it out on the test stand and run it, and you know, uh, it 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 just was hilarious. So uh, that was a good good thing about Oshkosh. So uh, the camaraderie when when it you know even when all those airplanes are gone. And, and we have the airport to ourselves. It's a pretty fun place. It's, uh, it, it really is just, just amazing that all this happened and kind of in this one place and with so many people sharing ideas and, and, and friendly competition, you know, et cetera. Tell me about the, how that then uh, evolved into the, um, the Son X and, and how that, cause that, Really, it ultimately becomes not just the name of the plane, but the name of the company. Yeah, well, it's a, it's kind of a goofy story. Uh, you know, actually, uh, I I sold the uh, Monad experimental aircraft in 1986 or so. Times were really bad, but I, I sold to another company in England, uh, some investment capitalists that had some big ideas, which didn't pan out, and that went out of business. So uh, John was doing an, another job. <laughs> And um, I had my kids to worry about. And uh, when they when they they graduated from um, or were ready to graduate from high school, the company that I worked at was uh, actually did pretty well. It was in, in charge of all the marketing and design. The company was making a fair amount of money. But I told Betty, I said, you know, when the kids graduate and go to college, I'm out of it. I'm going to go build airplanes. And uh, and I did. I, I got got a, a built an rocket L3 that was pretty cool, and started building Cubs, rebuilding Cubs. I rebuilt 14 Cubs, oh, and then uh, 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 we had uh, contact. I had I built four vagabonds, which are still Piper Cubs, and the the Piper the vagabonds met what is the European um, microlight category. Actually, the Italian microlight category. They were 1,100 pounds. They 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 stole stole at 40 miles an hour. And uh, if if you had those, you wouldn't have to have a license. You could fly the airplane to a maximum altitude of 500 feet. By the way, uh, and, and a thousand feet on Sundays. Yeah, we, we don't want you to scud run, but the maximum legal altitude for this yeah. airplane is 500 feet. So so we sent we sent a couple of these vagabonds over to England, and they. And the guy that, that bought them uh, recognized my name, and he knew about the sonnery, and he said, you know, so, oh, we'd like to get some sonneries brought up. So, they, you know, trying to make a long story short, we started shipping sonner. I started getting sonneries from all over the place, guys that were selling them and, and, and putting them in containers and sending them over to uh, to uh, Italy to, to be used in this ultra, in this this microlight category, but the, the problem is that it stalls at about 44 miles an hour. It's really cheating. Uh, they tried to do all kinds. Of, so they said, hey, I want you to design an airplane. We'll put it two place side by side, airplane like uh, like the Sonnery. So I, I, I diddled with it a little bit. And, and uh, Pete Buck, my, my, my real, I, I kind of was a mentor to him, but, but um, Pete came to work for me when he was 16 years old. Built a sonare, got his A and P license, uh, and in 1982 got an opportunity to go to Lockheed, uh, where he became a floor manager for a project called Have Blue, and uh, uh, and, and the 117, and he went to night school and got his master's degree and and uh, and, and beyond, and uh, he's now a fellow at, at Lockheed, you know, which is uh, I'm extremely proud of him. And uh, he's a busy, busy guy, but we've collaborated on all the airplanes, uh, including the Sonar, uh, Sonics. And uh, I, I kind of was going to do the tube and fabric thing, and, and we talked, and we had built the Monix, which is really the, 
granddaddy of, of uh, Sonics. It's the kind of proved the concept of building this box and putting a round canopy and cowling on it and making it fast um, and, and look kind of cool. Uh, so uh, we, we decided to start with a clean sheet of paper and do a, a metal airplane. Pete did most of the work on it, really. Um, and I, I did all the finishing stuff, the, the, the styling, et cetera. So um, we're, we're a great team, and he was doing this in his spare time. So we built these, uh, these prototypes. Um, we actually, um, my little shop that's now our office was full of, full of Piper Cubs and five Sonics is all at the same time. It's a little 2,500 square foot hangar. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, we, we completed the airplane at, uh, under contract uh, to design this airplane for the, the, the micro light category. So it was 1,100 pounds gross, stalled at 40 miles an hour. Um, you know, used minimal horsepower, uh, and we, we proved that. I delivered one of the airplanes to Italy and flew it out of some ridiculous airports. Um, and then uh, uh, we, we decided, hey, this would be a great little sport plane. Uh, and the plans were, were the part of the contract was to develop a set of plans where the airplane could be built from scratch or by uh, unskilled labor. So everything had to be defined in the plans. Uh, you can build every part from the plans. Um, and they're in, of course, in SAE and metrics. And, and um, so we said, this would be a good little sport plane for here. And, you know, coincidentally, a couple of years later, uh, uh, Sport Pilot came to the United States and was based basically on what the Italian or European microlight category was. So we had an airplane installed at 40 miles an hour, 1,100 pound gross. Of course, the gross weight got not up, but you know we still have a pretty good useful load even at 1,100 pounds, and uh, we have a lot higher performance than a lot of airplanes in the category. Um, and so it became what we call the thoroughbred sport pilot airplane because it was it was there before anybody else. That is and, so. And it's just so, gained in popularity. <laughs> yeah, and you know one of the things that that I'm really fascinated about is every. Uh, every innovator, every founder of, of of a company for kid airplanes that has always had a philosophy, like there's something to it. And your philosophy that speaks to me so much is about this being attainable and affordable and, and easy to do. And like you said, you even emphasize that like every part can be built from the plans, even if you want to. What what made you embrace this this as the philosophy, as the niche, as opposed to maybe speed or performance or, or whatever. This area that to this day, that message is you can do it almost, to, is the message to everyone. You can afford to build an airplane seems to be the message from your company. Yeah, well, it's simple. I was a school teacher. Um, that first sonnery that I built, uh, I had a brand new engine in it. All the materials and everything, the total investment in that airplane was twelve hundred dollars. Wow! So, you know, we had an airplane that, uh, from my mini <laughs> the year before, uh, that would do about one hundred and ten miles an hour uh, in in one year. Both Steve and I had uh, had beat the fastest VW powered airplane at the time it was uh, one hundred and twenty eight miles an hour. Then we came to Oshkosh and both were capable of 170. So it was a quantum leap in performance and for a very low dollar. And the idea was to get into racing for, for a minimum cost. So that just continued. You know, it was, it, it's the idea of, of being able to build an airplane for the price of an average automobile. And, you know, nowadays the average automobile is an SUV. Um, and, you know, it's like, uh, but we can still we can still fit into that that price bracket pretty much, not twelve hundred dollars. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I mean from from looking at the prices on your on, on your website and your list prices of of completed kits, you're you're pretty far below a lot of um, most average cars that people are are buying still. That, yeah, that's, really, that's an amazing accomplishment. Really yeah, because this is sport aviation. It's it's just a sport. You know, it's 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 a it is a big hobby, and uh, these are toys. Uh, and uh, you know, for the most part, you know, I've I've never been interested in 
I got cross country flying out of my out of my system a long time. If you're gonna trying to fly cross country in a, something like a sonary that's neutrally stable, that has a very small cockpit, and you don't have GPS. We had a my first radio was a little little uh, uh, handheld first radio that came out that had that had like uh, two or three channels and a tunable receiver to be able to get into DuPage County Airport. And, uh, you know, pulled out a sectional. Those were the large sectionals at the time. <laughs> uh, trying to follow a line. The airplanes all over the place. You know, you'd look up from a map. You didn't know what attitude you were in. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we traveled all over the place with those airplanes. And, uh, and you know, and I thought, yeah, I think that I got that out of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to go out and fly. Uh, uh, like the average sport pilot, you know, fly an hour at a time, get a, get your system juiced up, uh, terrorize the neighborhood if you have the uh, the, the proper equipment, like a jet, uh, <laughs> and then uh, uh, you know that's that's the joy of flying. It it it's amazing because what, you know one of the wonderful things about I think what what experimental amateur built has done to the entire world of flying is that while we watch the prices of the typical general aviation airplane at any level, two place or four place, continue to skyrocket. This is this is where it's still attainable. This is where if someone were certainly to come up to me and say, um, "Hey, I I I would really like like to I desperately would love to have a plane. I just don't think I can afford it." I mean. I'd be like www.sonicsaircraft.com. Like, go talk to these guys. Take a look at what you're talking about for price. Because, it, tell me if I'm wrong, but you're, you still make it possible for people for less than sixty thousand dollars for kits. Oh yeah, way less than that. Yeah. So yeah, what, people... what? Give me an idea of like someone looking. You know, if someone did come to you and it, putting scratch built aside, if they actually did want a kit. Um, where, what, what is the starting range of, of, of investment to be flying? It's actually pretty low, and you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to our website. I don't. <laughs> well, last I checked, That's it was. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's. I think it's below fifty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty. It, it is pretty. You know, if, you could easily build an airplane for thirty grand. You know, whatever. You know, wow. Thirty grand uh, to be flying, to engine, me, everything. That's amazing. But to my head, that's outrageous, and uh, it should be a lot less money than that. But we're we're in a different era. I, you know, like my my uh, Aranka I bought for four hundred dollars, hmm. and uh, and and rebuilt it, and I sold it for eleven hundred dollars, and I was happy. Um, and and today, you know, when I, when I was building Cubs, there were I was selling brand brand. I mean, completely rebuilt the uh, beautiful airplanes. I had award-winning airplanes, and they were they were thirty-five thousand dollars. Well, that's a pipe of cub. And yeah. It, you know, most most of the value of that is in the name. That's but, true. You know, but but the, uh, you know, to build an airplane that, that's that's somewhat practical and and uh, usable, like like a Sonex is. Uh, you know, we've had we've been uh, our philosophy a little bit to allow, you know, and, and support other engines, bigger, uh, more powerful engines than uh, our AeroVs. But uh, I'm putting my AeroV turbo up against most of the other popular engines that we have. Well, that's what's really fascinating also. So going back, um, that I, I really, it's very interesting that, you know, you very much uh, uh, stuck with the AeroV concept. So tell me a little bit about what makes that engine so uh, uh, so durable, so attractive cost-wise, and uh, why has it been so resilient? Do you think? Well, what you know, the interesting thing is the VW, the boxer engine, you know, is kind of typical design of airplane engines anyway. And they were built, you know, they built thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of engines. Right. Um, so you know what. I've, I've continued to develop it. It started the Aero V series back in the 80s um, with, you know, foundry castings for some of the parts. And uh, we, had, we had a single magneto and uh, 
Uh, we use the POSIC injector carburetors, which is very similar to the aero injector now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of evolved. And when, once we got into the Sonics, we knew that um, it was designed for about 80 horsepower. And uh, we would go back to developing the engine. We have our own, uh, you know, our own crankshafts. Uh, that a lot of the all the parts, the red parts on the engine that you see uh, from the carburetor on, on the aero carb, aero injector, whatever you want to call it, um, on up to our ignition system, which is kind of unique uh, in the engine. We have we have actually four uh, ignition modules. Uh, two of them are electronic, 12 volt powered, um, and uh, two that are magnetos. And uh, so any any one of those will run the engine, two cylinders. Uh, which is a great safety factor, I think, and it's very simple. Uh, very few moving parts uh, in the engine. When I look at some of the other engines that we're supporting, and I'm, I'm, out, I'm outspoken about it, I look at a, I know a Rotax engine is very, very popular and they've had a lot of success, but oh my God, I look at the firewall forward, I look at the, you know, the ignition systems and the redundancy of electric and everything, every pumps and radiators and all kinds of crap that's hung on the front of the end are very nicely done but not my idea of how it should be and, yeah uh, you know I, it's just not where i'm at what do you think the reason is that the aero v has been so so successful as you've mentioned in its range but when it comes to automotive conversions of of, of any other kind um they just don't seem to be as successful. They don't seem to get the traction, whether it's even with water-cooled ones or even, you know, uh, a Corvair or anything. It just seems like the Aero V is fairly unique in that it's it just has been so successful, works so well, but there doesn't seem to be a higher horsepower or other versions out there that have ever really translated. Right. You know, what's interesting is, is that I look at every time an auto conversion comes out, I look at what is the front of the airplane going to look like, hmm. uh, and and you know when you when you look at look at a Sonics, we're we're down to a, a five inch diameter spinner. Uh, a lot of people go, you know, why you know, I put a big spinner on? It. Well, flying Sonarays for all those years with twelve inch spinners, um, you know, you're run, you're running different RPM ranges all the time, so the spinner is constantly doing this. And it fatigues. And I've had too many spinners go by my canopy looking like a bushel basket. Um, and uh, it, it it was one of the things that I wanted to design out. Now, when it, when it comes to the automotive conversions, a lot of them have big ring gears, like a light homing, you know, has to have a big spinner because it's got such a big, big flywheel on the front. Uh, whereas the uh, Aero V or uh, any of the VWs, Revmaster, any of those conversions, you can make a pretty streamlined column mm -hmm. uh, and 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 get the thing whittled down. The Sonar is the same way. Uh, in any of the Formula airplanes that use Continentals, so the same thing. But guys have you know they, they have goofy thrust lines. Uh, they might have a reduction drive, but it you know. How do you put that on in front of an airplane without having a tremendous amount of frontal area? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So we can do yeah. a lot less. We can do a lot more with less horsepower because and we can make more aerodynamic aircraft. Is it geared? I'm sorry. Is it geared? No, the Aero V? Yeah. No. No. So no That's gear that. reduction to deal with or anything like that. Right. It's just straight out the crankshaft. Uh, we've got a real, really robust crankshaft. Those crankshafts are made. You know, it's based on a design for for uh, drag racers and everything else. A big counterweighted stroke crankshaft. So our, our normal VW is uh, 1600 cc's, and we're up to 2180. And then uh, well, then we then we go to a turbocharger. You know, one of the unique things that that I'm very proud of this uh, uh, a relatively new innovation of, is our is our turbo cooling system. Now, most uh, general aviation aircraft uh, that run turbochargers have a lot of problems with coking 
uh, uh, oil being cooked when the turbochargers shut down, the, the bearing race gets gets coked up and it freezes the turbo. And, uh, and you can't, you know, with when, if you're using low lead fuel, um, you can't use synthetics with it because it doesn't, they don't pull out all the bad stuff and the, that adds to the coking problem. But one of the things that Garrett turbocharger said on white paper is that if you have a, uh, a turbocharger uh, and it's using leaded fuel, blah, 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 it should be liquid cool. Now all your automobile turbochargers are liquid cool. They have a, when you shut down, some of the radiator fluid is circulated through the turbocharger, keeps it cool. Well, in a normal aircraft, you don't have that. So what we did is develop the system, and our, our, our turbochargers are automotive, so they have those passages. And what happens when the airplane shuts down? We have a thermostat. Uh, we have a small uh, coolant system that, that weighs all together five pounds. So like an oil cooler, Mm -hmm. with a little header tank and uh, it uses uh, uh, non-water coolant uh, and uh, it, it circulates uh, with a little pump that's off of a Prius that's used for cooling their electric. The you know, only thing I like about a Prius uh, <laughs> and the drivers uh, <laughs> is that, that that little pump uh, turns on and uh, circulates uh, fluid until the, 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 the bearing housing cools down. So you wow. know, the, the turbo is seven, 800 degrees when it shuts down and that, that temperature leaches into the bearing housing center of the, of the turbocharger. So we have the only liquid cooled system for an air cooled engine on an airplane and it works very, very well. That's fascinating. And and it, the advantage of having the uh, turbocharger on there is it is it, uh, it down at lower altitudes as well? Is it kind of all the time? The turbocharger, uh, we, we're, we're uh, using it kind of normalizing, but uh, it gives us a boost. So when we prop the airplane, you know, there's a lot of compromises if you don't have a, a, a controllable prop. But uh, one of the nice things about the turbocharger, you know, if we go to 5,000 feet with our with our 2180 uh, cc VW, we can outrun our six-cylinder Jabru's because they're losing power and we're maintaining uh, wow. well over 80 horsepower at altitude. So we get a lot of performance out of your plane, and this takeoff is pretty exciting too. That's <laughs> that's that's so so cool. And I, and again, I I love the way that 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 your designs look and, and, and everything about it. So it's very, very neat. Now there's another design there's that- the box. This is the box, you know. It's got oh, a box and rounded turtle yeah. bed and a canopy and a round cowling. That's what makes it work. You it's can tell that box. you're an art teacher. You made those, you, you, you took a box and managed to smooth it out at the front more than most. <laughs> yeah. tried to. So I'm gonna show so, something else here. That's my favorite thing on this and that is you decided, uh, and you're speaking to a, 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 although it's a straight tail guy, but a bonanza guy, and uh, you you went went for that the uh, the wide tail. So, what what made this the the thing that you decided to then go go after? What what drew you to to going to a wide tail? You never saw a t-tailed or a straight tailed bird. Excellent so, point. You know. The, uh, <laughs> That's the, like your mic drop. Nothing else to say. <laughs> yeah. The Monix racer uh, and uh, even some of our, even the Moni had a little sub rudder uh, in the fairing of the tail wheel, etc. So, so these are not y, uh, V tails or Y tails. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have a different concept of, of the, the angle of the tail um, is different than a Bonanza. A Bonanza is very flat. Um, which is not good, and uh, uh, it, it works, but it could be better. Uh, so we we adapted a white tail. Does it does it perform any better? The, you know, it's hard to measure uh, any any difference in performance between the the straight tail and the and the white tail. And actually, if you had a rear view mirror, you wouldn't know, in, unless you had one, you wouldn't know which one you were flying. Um, but I'll tell you what, if you want to an airplane with any curb appeal, 
the, the Y <laughs> table does it a lot better. Well, that's what I was going to say. It just looks cool. So, when, I mean, when did you convert over and decide when, when and decide that you wanted to approach the Y tail concept? Well, yeah, actually, uh, Pete and I we we uh, we had to wanted the Y tail on the Sonic the Sonics prototype, but. You know, our discretion is a better part of valor. We, we we knew that there was so much market inertia uh, because of all of, you know, I, again, one of those things that I get asked, does it fly like a bonanza? Well, yeah, it does fly like a bonanza. It uses Bernoulli's principle. <laughs> and, 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 the, the, the point is that, it you know, it doesn't wander around any more than, uh, you know, uh, many of the conventional airplanes with straight fins. Well, as you uh, mentioned, it's not a V-tail, it's a Y-tail. Exactly. And, and it has a rudder that gets rid of, or, or, or helps with the, the, the issue of perverse yaw uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with an upright V-tail. And um, that, so, you know, it works. And we have to close out the back of the fuselage anyway, so we might as well put a rudder on it. <laughs> So, so basically, how much of that do you think was the 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 art teacher in you coming out and saying that at the very beginning that that you still just wanted a plane that looked that cool? Yeah, I I I, I guess it, you know it, 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 the lines and everything are a combination of a lot of people. You know, it's not ex, not exactly a camel, uh, but it it you know it's a it's a culmination of a, a number of people's input and Pete's mostly and and um, and, and myself and and uh, we you know we we tried to improve the airplane uh, from the from the initial uh, Sonics and YX to now the B models which have a wider perceived, perceived wider cockpit and uh, more fuel etc. Well, you did something else also recent, uh, not not uh, not incredibly recent, but here you've got um, you decided to cave in and put a nose wheel on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It, it, the Sonics is has a, something that Whitman taught me was uh, you know put a direct steering tail wheel on the airplane. So the air it doesn't have a swivel tail wheel. It doesn't have springs that uh, you're always behind on, and uh, you have direct steering. It's like I always say. I tell everybody, you know, try try to drive drive your car with two bungees on the steering wheel, you know, and you know, can imagine what a catastrophe that would be. Well, that's what you got when you have a tail wheel with springs on it. You, you can't, they just don't work. Um, so we, we use a direct steering tail wheel. Uh, the airplane doesn't, you know, notice that the Sonics doesn't sit at a real high angle of attack on the ground. It sits at the proper angle of attack so that it can fly off itself. Hmm. Uh, we don't have to, you know, when we when we take off in a in a you know, standard gear Sonics or YX, it's just give it throttle and keep it straight. Just keep your feet flat on the floor, like you're driving a car, and the airplane will fly. That's all wow. it does. So um, that makes it easier to take off and land because uh, it's just at that attitude. Um, you know, some of the airplanes that's sticking up way up. I know they have to do that because of their prop clearance, et cetera, but another advantage of using an, air, little air, an airplane that has a fast turning motor with a small prop. Right. Now, so you started with the racer, you went from there to what I'll call kind of the everyman's airplane uh, that, that, that kind of did everything and, and, and served the population, just like the engine itself that you built it around. Yeah. What then brought you to saying, I want to, think motor glider <laughs> well that's pretty simple you know what we, we we built the, the first glider we built was the monterey and it was really actually very successful that was a that was a kit air a kit glider had a 36 foot wingspan and all bonded aluminum wing there were no rivets in the way uh it was a pod uh tail boom with a with a v-tail um, and, and we put a kit together for that airplane, um, and it, it, it got a lot of help developing the airplane. Uh, George Moffat, the two-time world soaring champion, was one of our 
our test pilots and I'm really a good mentor for that. I never flew a glider before I designed this Monterey. So and, you, you designed uh, an air, a glider having never flown a glider? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and when I built the first prototype, it had a, a stick that had a total travel of only two inches. Because uh, I thought it should be sensitive, you know, should be responsive. <laughs> it ended up having six inches of total travel at the stick because that was ridiculously sensitive. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still here. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, so that, that, that we put that kit together that had everything in it, uh, instruments, uh, everything except the paint, all the glue, fasteners, blah, blah, blah. It was $2,500. Wow. And then if you added an engine, that was another, I think it was about seven or $800 to put an engine to self-launch. Because it, 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 you know, you just plug the engine in like an outboard motor on a, on a <laughs> rowboat, and uh, you could go off and go fly. Uh, so, so the glider idea, the, you know, when, when we, we, uh, this is a little side story, I don't know if we have enough time, but but uh, when we were looking for engines for the for the uh, the Monterey, um, we we found some surplus engines, a snowmobile, a little 250 cc single cylinder, whittled them all apart. Pete and I worked on this, uh, whittled this engine all the way down to to where we used the radio battery to fire the ignition, <laughs> uh, and it prop started. So <laughs> Pete still has, I think, 16 or 18 stitches that he had in his hand. Because I would go, we're going to go fly and prop this thing for me. <laughs> yeah. It's just like a model airplane engine. Um, and, and we were contacted. Uh, and we Actually, Benny and I went out all, all the way to Japan to essentially deal with Zeno engines that uh, do a single cylinder, uh, rebuild, uh, re bring these engines back into production. And they were very popular for ultralights at the time. Uh, so we, we actually did the ultralight guys some favors by getting this engine back in production. But, but this Italian company wanted us to test another engine. That's it's, it's, it's time for another story. But, but uh, we developed an, uh, they developed an engine called the KFM 107. It was a little two-cylinder, 25-horsepower engine. It was just exactly what I wanted for my glider. And the owner of the company, uh, this Bruno Grana, who's a real promoter, they, they made go-karts. They made the best go-karts in the world, where they taught all the, all the uh, Formula One drivers uh, on their go-kart. So um, they, they had the premier two-cycle designer, uh, Cesare Basilio was his name. And um, he uh, designed this aircraft engine because he was a pilot. He wanted to do it. And uh, we had this nice looking little air, air, aircraft engine. And Bruno goes, you know, John, everybody knows the Monterey. So we're going to build this engine for you. But we really would like you to uh, premiere it uh, on a different airplane. And I go, what? <laughs> <laughs> so in nine months, again, we designed the Moni, um, which was a little motor glider. Uh, and it um, it came out with a KFM 107 engine. Serial number one engine was on serial number one airframe here at Oshkosh uh, the next year. And uh, we we flew it all week. We we didn't even have it didn't even have the alternator yet. Uh, uh, we could start it electrically, but we didn't have an alternator. And actually, we started that engine. Every, I flew it every day and started on one engine charge. And one 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 battery charge. Just week. charge just charge it at night. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even have to do it. It's just, it's just so uh, that led to you know back to the Sonic story about building uh, uh, designing the Sonics. Uh, Pete was working on a blown up Moni for so he could fly his daughter, and it was based on the the, the same concepts that the 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 uh, the Moni and the Monix the Monix came before the Moni but um, that 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 kind of box structure I talk about all the time and uh, uh, he said you know I've got this in move you know we should base the Sonics on on this kind of 
concept that brought me around to making it all metal. And then, of course, the real deal was the the the, the uh, Xenos is basically um, moments and everything are just scaled up from the Moni, right? And that airplane, it, it it shares the same cockpit as the Sonics, but it's a you know longer fuselage, a lot longer wing, forty four foot wingspan, and it's the basis for our Taros. Um, which is the UAV that we built. Right. So um, <laughs> so you created all of these, and then the one that everyone knows probably the most at this point is, and I'm going to bring up the picture of it, of course, it's this bad boy right here. <laughs> yeah. It's the jet. So yeah. you put a jet on it. I mean, obviously... Like you said, your approach to the airplanes have been, this is a toy, this is for fun. Where did the idea come from, or what was everybody drinking at the time when they decided? Well, you know, was... it, all they say is there, there is a lot to do. There, alcohol is, has a lot to do with. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like our electric airplane. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the same year we flew the jet, or I flew the jet, um, I also flew an all-electric YX, and uh, we own all of the technology, the motor design, the, all the battery management, the the uh, uh, the controllers, etc. And that's that's an ongoing thing in the background, um, but because the jets kind of. You know, but we, you know, one of so we Pete and I were looking at. At some of these model jets, you know, they're, they're getting bigger and bigger. And uh, we found found the one. And we said, "Hey, this guy, thing's got 150 pounds of thrust. That's enough to fly an airplane." And we designed a a, a rough, uh, you know, a, a really down dirty prototype for the jet. Um, the engine cost, you know, maybe 10 grand, but it didn't have. It was from an English company, of course. You know, it's like like uh, it. it Anything that comes out of them that has anything to do with ignition, <laughs> and I think people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh. um, it, it didn't have a way of igniting the engine, so it didn't have a controller. Um, so we kind of went down a blind alley, and then we, we met Bob Carlton, uh, that was doing his uh, his jet uh, glider routine at, at Oshkosh, and uh, that put us on the track to using the PBS engine. And uh, got it on the, the initial prototype. Had a lot of teething pains with that. I, you know, my crazy idea was it's was, uh, was going to be like a glider with a single wheel gear. Uh, that was a really dumb idea uh, because once you came up with the power of the jet, the tail wheel came off the ground. He had no control of the airplane. So after <laughs> making a lot of excursions around the airport, some were pretty lengthy because the engine doesn't step down right away. <laughs> we, we ended up with a tricycle gear and made six very successful flights with that first prototype and then developed JSX-2 from it, which is a much more refined airplane. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it took me uh, 69 years to be a jet pilot, and I had to build it myself. So um, that's, that, that, that's one of the rewards of my life, I think, is that, that uh, now I'm 78, and... Uh, uh, it's still, uh, you know, it brings chills. It's a, it's, it's a cool airplane. It really is. I mean, how, how amazing. I mean, of all the planes, if you just want to think fun, you, that that's that's what I think every time I'm, I'm at Air Venture and go over there and see what you've got going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, like I said, the, the primary thing of sport is to be able to terrorize people. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, it, Sometimes it's yourself uh, that gets terrorized. <laughs> of course, that was the jet deal. And uh, my late son was, uh, you know, so so opposed to it. He's like, Dan, you're going to, you know, da, 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 da. He just, and once he got an opportunity to fly the jet, he was all in. It, it was uh, it, it was quite a quite a day when he got to fly it. And he said, oh, this thing is really nice. Wow. It flies really well. And you're working on a two-seat version of that now. Yeah, that's the ultimate. I mean, um, 
right now, you know, uh, our concept is that uh, this will be the lowest cost jet trainer ever produced. Wow. Uh, and that's that's a big thing. I mean, you know, uh, we like to have them trained for a, a single place, but um, uh, it'll also be a two-place jet. And everybody said, you know, I want to take uh, two people along. Now, now, with that, there are compromises because we're using the same engine. So the airframe's a little bit bigger. We, the wing loading, we're keeping um, reasonable so that we'll get uh, pretty good performance out of the airplane, but it won't perform like the single place. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. But it'll be nice solo. It'll be really fun. And then the latest news, because uh, I don't want to miss it before running, uh, you know, as we're running out of time, is something that really is a departure from things, although it looks like it comes right back to the beginning a little bit. There's a little bit of Whitman somewhere around here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't build a box with a high wing and not think of a tailwind. That's it's as simple as that. <laughs> and it's, it's an all metal one and it's cantilevered and uh, uh, you know it uses some of the tricks that we use in our, in our airplanes. Um, I really wanted to be the, this to be a Y tail um, but that doesn't work with a high wing. It just doesn't work. Uh, What's the reason for that? It, well it's this down wash off the wing um, that the tail would have to be really high mm. uh, to get out of that so it it, it, it just uh, it, it behaves differently, so I had to give up on that. Well, it looks cool, and yeah. I can't wait for being able to see one of these in in person. Uh, yeah, is, we can't either, and we're working hard on it. Uh, uh, really, Mark Shabel, our, our, uh, our general manager, has really um, taken over the reins on that project. Um, our engineers are, are busy, you know, with me constantly changing things. Uh, uh, on the jet, you know, come in. Well, I think we ought to do this, you know. And then they go, "Well, are you kidding?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the fun. That's the fun. That's the fun of the business. So, so is is most of the development right now around those two things that Mark's handling the the high wing and you're handling the two place jet, and then everything on the 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 Sonics and YX are basically refinements and just supporting the business and and really that's the where the bulk that's, i assume of the yeah. sales are we know that we you know we're we're cognizant of the fact that we have to have new product every once in a while and, um, you know the b model was a big step over the uh, over the other airplanes and uh, um you know it it uh it, it's made it sonics viable again and uh, that plus all of our uav stuff we're busy as all get out so tell me a little bit about that. You've got, and I'll, I'll show this as well. Um, um, you've got a, a few different things. You've got a twin jet uh, unmanned system, and, yeah. um, and 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 also a propeller version. Right. Well, the block four is just a concept. That's not. But the twin jet uh, is a reality. They've been delivered. Um, they're they're. It's an Air Force project that we can't talk about much. Um, okay. But you can only imagine it's 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 a pretty wicked looking airplane. I'll tell you that. Uh, and uh, and then we have uh, the Taros, which is the big uh, UAV that that is now a B model, which is 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 not like the pictures of the airplane we have on the website. It mm. looks a lot different. And wow. um, it's it's really cool because it's uh, it's going to be used for civilian purposes. Um, as well as uh, uh, some other things. It actually, this the B model of the Taros was featured in a in a uh, Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> I'll and, have to go look at that. Yeah, and people had to see it, but it was there. So we're we're, we're proud of that. That's so, so awesome. Well, John, thank, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your evening uh, to join us here on Social Flight Live. It's just, your story is wonderful. I love your company and the products and the fact that it's just designed to be attainable, that, it, that it's just embraced the fun part of aviation and that your message is, is really not just about the fun, but about the fact that it, anyone can, can do it and that it's meant to be affordable. That's that's really you've it, it, you've outdone yourself. 
Well, thank you very much. And it's, it's going to be cool. We're going to do the one week wonder uh, next year. And, you know, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we'll see, you there. <laughs> we'll see you at Air Venture next year, though, and, uh, and see what yeah. other surprises you have in store. Yeah, well, there'll be a few. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Okay, Jeff. Thank you. And to everyone else, I'd just like to thank you again for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will be off for the next two weeks at NBAA and also doing some flying. You can see the videos that we'll be producing about our visit to that show in Las Vegas on our YouTube channel. Just do a quick search on Social Flight, one word, Social Flight on YouTube. And that'll bring you to our page where we have this and all of the other shows that we have here from Social Flight Live, all there on our YouTube channel. And also, of course, you'll see our build of our Titan T51D Mustang that's behind me here going on as we continue to build that and put our build videos on the site as well. In addition, when we return on Tuesday, October 26th, we will be here with Brent Mall of Mall Aircraft followed on Tuesday, November 2nd with FAA Surgeon General Dr. Susan Northrup, and on November 9th, Mike Bush rejoins us here on the show. Until next time again, thank you all so, so much for joining us and being part of General Aviation's vibrant community, and I wish you all blue skies.